um, restaurant reality post COVID. And uh, for those of you who attended uh, the implications on staffing, we appreciate you doing that. Uh, today's presentation is on marketing, developing, implementing marketing post COVID. And so what we're going to do is touch all of the bases and maybe share a few specific examples of how we see restaurant marketing working today. And along that way, what I know we're going to be able to do is um, answer a few specific questions that probably brought you here today. Question number one, how many people are really thinking that advertising is marketing? Okay, is advertising marketing? Short answer to that is no. Advertising is a part of your marketing plan. That's one key thing that we're going to be talking about is marketing plan. Um, Another issue I know that you probably have is how do I know if marketing works? You know, how do I, how, how can I measure its success? And I think it, it, restaurants that pay more attention to market planning are going to be able to do that. Um, and marketing is something that we do to nurture our brand, build our revenue. Uh, and it is something that we would like to be able to look back to see um, what success was generated and what the cost was. Uh, final thing is, can you really plan marketing? And, and the reason that question comes up a lot is because I've dealt with independent restaurant operators for a long, long time. And too many times as independents, we're so busy working in the business that we don't take a step back and work on the business and actually plan. So marketing is, wow, it's February. We're two weeks away from Valentine's Day. We better think of something. What do we want to do on Valentine's Day? Who's doing the chocolate dessert? You run to Walmart and buy a bunch of stuff that looks pink so we can have some decorations. Um, and uh, we need a menu special, I guess. And um, how are we going to you know, promote this? Let's put a poster by the front door. In other words, it's very, very last minute. I see smiles. Yeah, so you've been there. I got it. OK, and so yes, we, we can actually plan. If we plan in advance, we do a much better job. Um, and we can execute so much better. Speaking of execution, if I had to boil down marketing post COVID, I would say there's one similarity between marketing your restaurant operation pre COVID. And that is executing well operated restaurants are the best way of developing and maintaining a market uh, marketing your brand. So the best way is a well executed operation. It's just that are we implementing our shifts the way we want to um, that's a question that's got to be answered. Uh, has everyone really bought into what the experience is supposed to be? Is it the food and the atmosphere and the lighting and the music and the concept and the design and the service all fitting together like we want to? These are all operational issues, I know, but these operations speak to marketing. So before we get into all kinds of marketing stuff, what we really want to do is make sure that we understand that the best way to execute a marketing plan is implement good, consistent daily operations. So why is that so important? Well, you know, when you think of it, you've got a captured market. If people are in your operation, they're, ha they're having lunch, they're having dinner, they met friends for drinks, uh, maybe they're uh, in a private dining room, they're there. 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. So we don't want to just be working the shift to get through the shift, to satisfy them for the moment, make sure the food was right, uh, make sure the right table got the right guest check, get through the day, finish our checklist and deposit the money. That's just working the shift. What we really want to be doing is marketing to the crowd. The big difference is working them so that they're not just satisfied for today, but they become loyal to you and they're out there already planning their next visit. So that's the big difference. Successful marketing doesn't just have satisfied customers. Successful marketing develops loyal customers. The difference between a satisfied customer and a loyal customer is the satisfied customer comes once in a while, eats, doesn't really pay much attention, pays, leaves. The loyal customer bonded with the experience. They get it. They really like being here. They feel like they belong. They, they know the servers. They appreciate the food. They, uh, they're now your walking, talking marketing representative. They're out there planning their next visit. They're more apt to bring people with them and come more often. So that's what we're shooting for. So how can we plan this? Yes, we can. Every independent restaurant operator really should sit and develop an annual marketing plan. So what is it that we're wanting to accomplish this year? What is it we want out of our brand? A list of the items that seem to work. Um, these items might be events. These items might be 
um, specials. These items might be holiday things, um, they, but they just need to be mapped out. They need to answer the question, how are we attracting the guest? Who's the guest we're going to be attracting? And then by scheduling what we want to do when, then we can develop a timeline. So if we know that January we're going to be doing what? Our after Christmas, hopefully we've got a lot of people coming in using those gift cards that were in their stocking stuffers. And what do we want to do that month? Is it just, is it in-house menu specials? How are we going to plan for our Valentine's Day? So we can timeline that. We can back up and say, well, during January, who's going to do what, by when, what's it going to cost to do my Valentine's Day promotion? In February, what are we planning for spring? Do we have a spring outdoor thing? Do we have a, um, a I don't know, a, a, a March or an April thing? Are we just promoting holidays only? Not that that's bad. We need more preparation for the Mother's Day and the Father's Day. Do we have some summer activities? Do we want to do something cool outside? Do we want to engage kids? Some restaurants have done that. Um, if it works for your concept, can you just imagine scheduling a summer uh, baking at the bakery cafe where kids come in and uh, moms and dads pay a fee and the kids can come in so many times each week and they learn baking and they have fun and they leave home with food and all this food is in boxes with your logo sticker on it that sits in the house for days advertising to mom and dad who you are. So some of these activities will work for some concepts. Not every activity is going to work for every concept, but you're going to select what it is you want to do, and by scheduling it, you can be more organized, better prepared, get more bang for your buck. Yes, track the buck. Part of the plan could be we want to budget. We want to budget. What is it going to cost to do those Valentine's Day decorations? Post this posting. Make a short video. A lot of these things that we're talking about now are fun to do. You include your staff, and you'll notice that the budget is very low because we're using social media so much or we're making in-house videos and we're doing that with staff and we're having fun doing baking and we're using our own equipment and we're posting it on our uh, YouTubes and Facebooks or clipping it on the website. So a good plan should be broken down into three sections. We're going to talk about each section. I've already given some examples of section number one. That's local store marketing. LSM for marketing nerds. And what that basically means are things that you're doing within the unit. Local store marketing. The second one is media. The media that you choose to inform. Um, and some of that might be more traditional media, ads, etc. Most of it's probably going to be digital. Digital media, managing your postings, Facebook, your email newsletters, um, uh, and uh, your Instagrams. Don't forget the website, which is not just information, but a tremendous marketing tool and needs to be updated regularly. So that's media. That's the second one. And then the third one that, that's part of your um, marketing plan is image. So every restaurant should have LSM thinking, should have media uh, thinking. That, that's the application. And then the third one should be all about uh, uh, image. Image building is going to be where we'll get into community activity. Some restaurants work very well by hosting events, promoting events, uh, teaming up with uh, charities for uh, specific purposes. Uh, some restaurants use public relations companies to maintain their brand, to keep their image involved and listed and uh, connected and hosting certain events. So it's a combination of the three that's going to work best for you. And typically, independently owned restaurants are budgeting about 4% of revenue for a marketing plan. So hopefully this already answered that first question. Marketing isn't advertising. Advertising is a part of marketing. Marketing is what we do in-house, how we schedule what we're going to do in-house, how we choose what media to promote what we're doing in-house, and how we're active in the community. Image, local store marketing, and media. Local store marketing used to be what the, ter the terminology used to be four walls marketing. Some of you might um, still remember that. Some of you may have been in management positions with companies where you preached that. It's the four walls of marketing. Uh, basically, that means everything that goes on that the guest is going to experience within your operation from the way it looks the way the sound is, the aroma, facility cleanliness, the greeting from the host, to the way the experience flows, manager touching the table, thanking them when they're going to the door, 
Everything that happens in that 45 to 60 minutes, every sign they see, every poster they read, the way the menu is laid out, if they pick up a takeout bag, did we put a little promotional um, leaflet inside? Did we put a little thank you card inside? All these little things would be local store marketing. Um, the big difference in local store marketing is that the four walls of marketing now really needs to be modified. I still remember preaching, I remember owning restaurants, working with the four walls of marketing. Post-COVID, we may as well broaden that to become what our world is today. It's really eight walls of marketing because we no longer live and die based on developing loyal customers from within our dining experience or within our banquet room or within our bar. Uh, we also have uh, the outside areas that have become more and more popular that we are concerned with. How does that market our brand? We have the pickup counter, the curbside business. We have drive-through for some people. And if you have drive-through, curbside or takeout, you'll notice you've probably had a 100% increase in that area of volume due to COVID. So it's something we really have to pay attention to. We have the phone-in order. How do we look at the phone-in order as a marketing tool? We have the online order. So online ordering, third-party delivery, our phone order for takeout, curbside pickup, our outside dining. We've really gone from four walls that help promote our business to eight or nine walls. That's one big change, thank you, um, COVID. And we have to pay attention to those because you might get to a point, depending upon your concept, where you have just as much emphasis that needs to be played on those other parts, that people aren't necessarily inside your restaurant or bars often, but they're still dining with you. So you still wanna market to them in the way you're handling the phone, the way you're handling online, how easy, how quick is our website? Because our website isn't just information anymore. It's got to be all marketing. Um, some of you might already be questioning, God, I wonder how well I'm doing with my phone-in orders because I do a lot of takeout. And I guess I'm going to be doing a lot of takeout more and more. Yes. People got used to that. Our consumer behavior has modified. It hasn't just been a temporary thing to do because we were closed down last year. Um, most consumer behavior has modified where people are accepting the fact that they love the idea of going out again, but they're not letting go of their concern over convenience and their concern over safety. So we're finding just as much curbside pickup, large family meals, phone-in orders, third-party delivery um, as we were doing before. So we can't think that just because I get to market them in my dining room again, yay, I can see these other things as less important because actually they're not, they're more important. So if we go to that marketing plan, and if the first thing you wanna write down is training and consistency on my new four walls, how I'm handling my outside, how I'm handling my curbside pickup, what's the script, how's the training? There's still some consumer engagement there. It isn't as long as I would have if they were in the dining room, but there's still exchange. How do I handle that phone in order? Do I get their number? Uh, do I text back? a confirmation, some people are doing, and that's a good thing to do. Um, is my phone order sort of a rushed, you know? Bernie's, what can I get you? Yeah, okay, hold on, and then they go away. Somebody else picks it up. Uh, who are you holding for? Oh, I was making a to-go order. Oh, okay, hold on, I'll get them. Is it one of those? I, I get that kind of experience picked up, and then they go, sorry, what can I get you? Okay, okay, okay. Sure, that'll be about 25 minutes. Or is it something like this? Thanks for calling Bernie's Best Burgers. Yes, absolutely we can do that. Would you like extra cheese? How about the large order of fries? Did you save room for a fudge brownie? Sure, we'll be happy to see you in about 20 minutes. Thanks for calling Bernie's. Is it that or is it the first, is the first one? The first one, just in a hurry to get the job done. I hope the burger's right and I hope it is ready in 20 or 25 minutes. That's what the consumer's thinking when they hang up the phone. The second one feels a little bit like, I don't know, I belonged there. I was welcomed. I just gave a quick cheeseburger order, you know. There was some suggestive selling. Maybe I didn't want the large fries, but it was nice to hear about it. No, I didn't save room for a fudge brownie. Still nice to hear about it. And I'm just feeling more confident that my meal is going to be prepared right and I'm going to pick it up in 20 or 25 minutes. Maybe it was just the calming voice. Maybe it was because someone was reading a script, you know, that 
reminded them to use the full name of the restaurant, remind them to thank them, remind them to tell them who they are. Hi, I'm Sheila. I'll be handling your order. Uh, Something like that. So thinking in terms of just getting through the shift, we do the first one all the time. Thinking in terms of marketing for post-COVID, we're now going to be doing that, right? How about the online order? Um, If more people are going to be ordering online and if that's new to us, that means we've got to take a look at our website quickly. Okay, we've got to get maybe some assistance. Maybe we should get some advisement, perhaps right here at the SBDC to help take a look at our website. They'll do that for you and they're good at it. So we can update our website to make sure that it flows so that people can see that their time uh, is of value to us. They know who we are, what we're doing, click here, make an order, because if our website isn't current, if it isn't quick, if it isn't convenient, we cannot market well. In fact, we can actually lose guests because others are. So if we're going to do about this much business in online ordering, we really want those people to still get a good feeling of accuracy, friendliness from our website uh, so that we can maybe build that into this much. Everything now, if it's done well, is more marketing. So local store marketing, if it's done well, basically just gets our existing guests, somebody who already knows us and likes us, to use us more, come more often, spend more when they come, bring others with them. Uh, All three of those things do what? Raise revenue. And isn't that why you're here? Isn't that why you wanted to know about marketing? Because we know if we build our brand, we have a good chance of raising revenue. So so too many times we keep thinking about marketing needs to help me reach across town, chase down the freeway, and get that new um, intangible customer, the person who doesn't know about me, the person who's never been here before. And that's not a bad thought. We don't want to leave anyone out. But the low-hanging fruit, the easier thing to do, is preach our gospel to people that are already in the pew. Okay, you, if you've got people who like you, let's get them to love you. That takes that satisfied guest, makes them a loyal guest. They're not just coming and eating once in a while. They're coming more often. Okay, raised revenue, coming more often. Or they're bringing someone with them. That's a raise in revenue, right? We still didn't chase down a new guest yet. Or they spend more when they're coming because of the way we are promoting extra things and new packages. All three things raise revenue, and they're all coming from our existing guests. So if we handle our takeout orders well, if we do our online ordering well, what we're doing is talking to the existing people because they've already called us. But what we're doing is we're building revenue that way. That's why we want to pay attention to it. All we're looking for in marketing is to make sure that our brand creates a higher level of value in the mind's eye of the user. If we're more valuable to them, they will be using us more. They will be telling other people about us and they'll be planning to come back. So to kind of wrap up, local store marketing means everything that we do inside, but we've broadened that to include everything that impacts our customer outside. Handling of the phone in orders, handling of the online orders. We're now measured by our convenience, our speed, and our friendliness. So. Here's a couple of tips that I saw through COVID, and they're so cool because here I am telling people about them. They happened months ago, but there's a barbecue place uh, where I used to live that was very close, and I would go there regularly. So during COVID, of course, I was a champion of curbside dining. I mean, who else was? I was chomping at the bit, you know, not being able to see my friends, uh, restaurants that I worked with, not being able to go out. I was going nuts like most of you. So I became a champion of curbside pickup. Like every other day, I was in somebody's parking lot. You know, so I got the drill, go online or phone the order. Some, some people told us of a particular parking place to park in. Other people just told us to come by. They always asked what car you're driving. They know to bring out the order. So most everything, you know, worked out, I don't know, pretty much the same. Until this barbecue place when I went there and the lady came out to the door and said, you want me to put this in the back seat? Okay, knew me by name because she was reading off the name. So Chris, you ordered this time and gave me the little, you know, review. You ordered this time the extra sauce on the side, it's here. You ordered this time the one piece of pecan. You ordered this, the what? So they confirmed the order, which you know they would have done inside. But a lot of curbside was just open. (laughs) There you go. Closed it up. Thanks very much. And they were off. What she did tell me about, which I really appreciated, was when I got back and I opened up and I'm taking out the food, and there was a card about this size, name and logo of the restaurant, and in the back, a little stamp. Oh, thank you. 
uh, we really appreciate your business. Hope you really enjoy your dinner. Uh, please let us know how we can help you or do anything special the next time you order. And it was signed by the manager on the shift. Now, two things I really liked about that, and hopefully these are two light bulbs that are blinking. One was the appreciation. You know, I got a thank you card. <laughs> I got a thank you card in my to-go thing. That's kind of nice. But the other thing I really liked from the business side of the point was the hook, the suggestion of the next time. Please contact, you could even fill in the blank. Please call Sheila and let us know if there's anything special that you might like us to do for your next order. So thank you for today's order. I'm hooking you for next week because I don't want you to forget about us and do curbside somewhere else. So that's, that's, that's good marketing. Um, here's another thing that I've seen happen with this expanded four walls becoming eight walls and people beginning to realize that local store marketing doesn't just exist in the dining room anymore. Um, and that's a follow-up text um, or sometimes a follow-up phone call. Uh, full service restaurants doing that. You know, if you called and made a reservation at a restaurant, they normally get your name and they also get your cell number. Okay, we're so used to just giving our numbers. Um, we give people our email addresses to get on their newsletter. We give people our cell numbers and we start getting texts and things. And right now that seems to work. We're in that day and age where everyone wants to feel included. You know, I think Facebook taught us that. You know, we don't want to be out of touch. Uh, I realize in a couple of years that might be different and maybe people aren't going to be as touchy-feely with social media as we are right now, but right now that is the way we exist. So I was kind of used to getting a text back saying, confirmation to people, blah, 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 this restaurant. See you then, 7.30. Thank you so much. What I wasn't um, uh, used to seeing was the next day, the little appreciative phone call. You know, a lot of times if you get a phone call on your cell and if you don't recognize the number, you're probably like me, you're too busy, you'll go check it later, you don't really answer it. So it's kind of a nice surprise when you do check. And here was this voice, hi, Mr. Tripoli, uh, this is Teresa, you know, yeah, from, you know, Steak Inc. Uh, you and your wife dined here last night. And we're just calling to say thank you. Uh, we hope you had a really good time last night. And by the way, um, again, with the name, you know, um, please remember I'm Teresa and I'd be happy to take your next reservation and help you with anything special if you need anything special on your next visit. A thank you? Now, you know that was a written script and it was probably added to the uh, job description of the host to come in and um, here's your script and here's last night's reservations. So you make five, six, seven, maybe 10 phone calls, you leave messages. Or I have seen it as a text. Thank you. Just following up, want to make sure everything that you picked up last night was on target. Thanks again for supporting your local restaurant, yada, yada, yada. So either way, these are tiny little touches that pre-COVID didn't see very much. During COVID, when everyone was living, obviously, on to-go containers and curbside pickup, some of the restaurants were looking at it as just getting by, and some restaurants were actually looking at it as a marketing opportunity. Which one were you? And what did we learn from this that's going to work now post-COVID? Okay, let's move on. That was just the, third, the first one. Remember I said there's three approaches to your independent restaurant annual program? First one was local store marketing and how important it is to realize that local store isn't the dining room or the bar anymore, but the whole experience, which includes phone, online, and everything else we've been talking about. So now let's move on to the second box, which is media. How do we use media? Media is obvious. We know when we say the word media, the media part of the marketing plan is going to be some of the more traditional things if we do, like say um, uh, radio pieces or a billboard um, for directional purposes or uh, an ad, for example. But traditional media has really been slowed down greatly by the increasing use of social media. Uh, you knew that without me having to tell you that. But the way you manage your time in, on your digital media says a lot now about how you're gonna be marketing your restaurant. So if you don't already have that really good, current, active, easy to read uh, website, if that website isn't formatted to work very, very well on a handheld, then we're behind, we're behind already. Okay? If we're not already um, having a good list of followers, people that we like, people that we know like us. So we've got one or 2,000 customers on an email list and we're nurturing them by sending them a little weekly update. Here's what's new this week at fill in the blank. I'll fill it in, here's an example. Alexandria, Louisiana. Husband and wife have a restaurant called Spirits. Okay, I've worked with them years ago 
They've become friends. Obviously, I don't live in Alexandria, but I enjoy getting their weekly updates. I'm on their list. Every week, there's a little update of what's happening at Spirits, what their weekly special is, or when they're doing their outdoor patio Thursday fun thing, or what new kid thing they're adding to their Sunday brunch. Every week, there's something. Keeps you connected. See, so I'm thinking, you know, if I lived there, I'd be eating there all the time. I feel a part of the place because of the way they keep me informed. You probably have some of those restaurants that are hitting you every week and it's because you're on the list. So how many of those people are on your list and how often are you doing your updates? I'm hopeful that you've got a part of your annual plan, weekly social media postings. If we're not Instagramming our food, if we're not Facebooking experiences, if we're not emailing our group to keep them connected, keep them coming more often, or helping us bring new people in, then we're losing a value in our brand, and we're losing revenue opportunity. Social media is the first thing that people are going to now. Sure, there might still be some printed brochures for some of you that might need that because you're booking catering or events, or you might need printed materials to leave with people after a meeting about the use of the banquet room. But formal print media has really gone down with this uh, experiential type of media working, and there seems to be a, an experience created by food photos and weekly memos and including people into things and invitation to events. Um, and that's, that, that really seems to work. So no big surprise there. You may in some smaller communities have great value in what we call reinforcement or directional, like a billboard on the busy street. But you're probably not able to get as much return on investment in print media now or ads. So I would save some of that for our next step, which is image related, community related, because investment in the community is important. Uh, investment in the community is, is building the brand. It, it's doing things in ways that help the community, but you're also doing it in a way that builds your brand and adds revenue to your top line. That's why it's part of the marketing budget. So leaving media for a moment and talking about those images building uh, examples what works for restaurants public relations works um, relating to the public having the public know you see you at say events catering functions that maybe build your correct image uh, being involved in activities sometimes you can plan and do this yourself Sometimes restaurants actually do engage public relations firms that keep you posted of interesting opportunities to participate in or keep your name in front of those people that from time to time need to reach out when they want quotes or they want examples or the food section of the newspaper wants recipes for a certain holiday. Have you ever noticed why is it that that Mexican restaurant got the mole recipe and I didn't know that they wanted a mole recipe. I would have loved to have given them mine. Well, more than likely, it's because four weeks earlier, when they knew they were planning the special Cinco de Mayo food section, uh, the writer reached out to one or two public relations people they know. And they said, what's happening in my market area? You know, who's new, who's cool? I, gotta, I wanna write on salsas and Mexican parties and I don't wanna write all the same old stuff. So she looks, of course, on her client list. Well, why don't we meet for lunch at blah, blah, blah? Because you need to meet, you know, uh, Mel and his ro wife, Rosie, anyway. And they're wonderful people. And so what happens? Maybe a couple months later, there's a story about Mel and Rosie in the newspaper, family tradition that they brought from wherever, and how they started with the grandma's uh, recipe off of a food cart, and it turned into a restaurant. Now, I just kind of morphed into a different story, but that was an actual couple that I worked with that have a wonderful Vietnamese restaurant. And their story was told, and it really did start that way. They met it during school. They married. They wanted to continue their Vietnamese family traditions in food, so they studied hospitality, but one of them had a grandmother back in the old homeland that was doing bowls off of a cart, and they said, let's get a picture of that cart. Let's get the original family recipe. Let that be the basis of the concept. So it was, and it's a wonderful story. Here I am years later talking about marketing, and it bounced in my head. See, so obviously it worked. So sometimes... Uh, public relation companies that will help keep you current with 
food sections, opportunities, interviews on morning shows, uh, anytime that they are looking to promote um, a food holiday, a food season, fall seasons coming, uh, we're going to be talking about pumpkin drinks and butternut squash again. So who's the chef that's on the morning show? Uh, maybe it's the guy that, of course, was recently introduced because the media connection through a PR company. So now that's not the only thing. Um, there are many restaurants that also do things uh, that are very, very important that develop a, a priceless image. Um, and they do it for the right reason, and it's community involvement. Uh, these are all true occasions. Uh, uh, there's a guy um, with a Greek restaurant, Dimitri Fetakakis, and I can remember years ago when he reached out to the blood bank and said, in my neighborhood, the big Winnebago van thing comes and parks, I think, in the library. Um, why don't you use my parking lot? It's a bigger parking lot. Um, you can park wherever you want on Saturday. Instead of everyone that donates blood then to the United Way getting a little shot of OJ and a small Oreo cookie, I'm gonna give them my chocolate fudge uh, baklava and maybe a, a gift card or something, you know. Well, they, you know, they jumped on it. And so I think because he did it once, now they always do it. So it's fun for him, it's community involvement. The neighborhood loves him for that. And guess who's always being promoted for a week in advance when all the TV cameras are talking about the United Way uh, you know, blood drive is, on, is uh, it's on its way. So please mark the date. Now instead of a picture of where to go and a list of the addresses and it's the library, it's the picture of the restaurant, a list of the dates and the van in his parking lot. So, you know, he's on major media for probably five, six, seven days. Everyone wins. The blood bank is happy. The blood drive is successful. He's involved. Customers love him. And any cost that's involved in doing this is well-spent marketing dollars. So what about the brothers uh, in Austin, Texas that have a concept called Catfish Parlor? Interesting. Um, it's just good, basic, fried Gulf Coast seafood. So, you know, nothing really special, award-winning. Every market probably has the place you like to go to for the catfish basket, for the fried shrimp po' boy. Okay, so they have one on one side of town, one on the other side of town. Now, I think the reason they decided to make their effort educational is I think it's either their mother or mother-in-law. I think someone spent their entire career in teaching. So they said, what we're going to do as a good promotional tool is let's say at the beginning of every school year, we're going to reach out to the school closest to us. So one location, I think it's a middle school. The other location, it's an elementary school. And what we're going to want to do is find out what need do they have this year that is unique, different, they didn't have the year before, they know that typical budget just doesn't carry. And we're going to find a way of promoting through our restaurant a way to answer that need. Well, every year there is one. I remember years ago when it was like we would really like to buy new furniture for the teacher's lounge. Okay, there's, there's no budget for that. Uh, one year I think it was additional playground equipment for uh, you know, the pre-K area. I think one year it was contributing to new band uniforms. So what they do is they pick a relatively slow night, either Monday or Tuesday night, and every one of those nights throughout the nine months of the school year, they reserve 10% of the revenue into a kitty for the help the school get the whatever fund. So this gives them nine months of having this big poster in the dining room, telling their customers to please come on this night, help us help the school. It also means that a relatively slower shift might get a little bit busier. That's always helpful. And then here's the real big bomb. In a, if it's a slower night, you know, that 10% isn't an awful lot of money on one evening. But that $60 here, $80 here, 110 here, adds up when you have four Mondays times nine months. Now at the end of the year, they get that really big foam board check to present the $2,600 or $2,700 to the school. That's a big deal. That will buy folding chairs and new coffee equipment, or it will help contribute maybe half the cost of band uniforms. Um, and so they're doing something big. And then the media that they get from that, now they're on the front page of the newspaper doing something really cool for the community that they believe in anyway. And whatever cost was involved in doing this, they code to marketing. So community and marketing work together. Uh, hopefully that's one of the key things you'll remember from today. So does that mean that restaurants are expected to do everything? Of course not. No one can do everything. But everyone can do something. 
So when you're doing your annual marketing plan, think of your something. What is the one thing? To them, it was education. Somebody else, it may have been health. Uh, somebody else, it might be health and they'll do fun runs. Um, somebody else, it might be music. I'm going to go back to that spirits example now because the owners were um, always interested in music. I don't know, maybe they played in bands when they were young, I don't know. But they were always interested in music. So what they thought they would do in their restaurant is have a stage to promote local, unknown, up-and-coming, second market bands, um, which needed the exposure and they were doing it for a lot of fun. So I think it was just maybe a couple Wednesdays a month. Uh, sometimes it became a Wednesday and a Friday a month. But what it morphed into was why can't I get all of these guys together, all of these up and coming brands, and promote an outdoor festival when the weather's nice in October? And they did that on the lot next door. So they did their own version of an Oktoberfest. So the bands are donating their time. They get some other restaurant friends to put up some food booths. They charge people uh, you know, something reasonable, like maybe $10 at the door for all day fun, eating, drinking, and watch uh, the, the, the music. All the money that's collected then goes to the school system's music department to help buy instruments for those kids that come to school that want to take band and can't afford the trumpets. So they get thousands of dollars every year, which buys a, a few really good guitars or trumpets or clarinets or whatever. It helps kids who need the help. It helps schools do their job better. It develops a tremendous image in the community, and it's something they wanted to do anyway. And whatever cost was involved, what was it? Marketing. See, even customer service, uh, I think, has a, a connection to marketing. Um, not just community programming, but how you handle customer service. Uh, and why that idea just popped into my head, I don't know, because it wasn't really on the agenda. Maybe it happened because a couple weeks ago, I was with a friend in his restaurant, and I, I just paused because of the way he reacted to somebody interrupting our conversation, telling him that the people that left on table 14, you know, weren't really happy, you know, they... They'll probably still come back, but they weren't really happy. They thought the ribs were cold. And he said, I, I know them, and the ribs were fine. And they never complain until after they eat most all of them anyway. So that stuck with me. So I was thinking, he's probably right on all points. You know? But when we're talking about marketing and we're talking about building revenue, please remember, it's not about right. It's not about wrong. It's about what works. So what should have happened in that situation? What would you do? For example, I'm reminded of a situation when I owned uh, my last restaurant, and um, it was a Wednesday lunch. I still remember it like it was yesterday. We were busy, and I was working the window. I was doing expo. I was setting up the food trays for the servers and the food runners. The chef's behind there. He's going crazy. And I remember watching him open up the oven and with his tongs, pulling out the nine-inch oval that had the half-roasted chicken, rosemary olive oil chicken on it. It was hot, sizzling. He set it on the tray under the heat lamp, keeping it hot while the rest of the order was completed. We put it on the tray, my fingers tingling because it was hot. The food runner goes right out the window, and, I mean right out the swinging doors, and I can see from this area he walks about eight or nine steps to deliver lunch. So this whole thing probably took about 30, 40 seconds. So where do you think I'm going with this? What happens about 45 minutes later now? I'm now off apron, the windows cool down, lunch rush is over, I'm walking, touching tables, thanking people, reminding them to save room for dessert, and I come to this party of three. What do you think happens when the lady says, well, lunch would have been better, but my chicken was cold? So what do you think? Say, I'm thinking, inside, you know, because you guys are busy operating restaurants, you know that if you're good at handling customer inter, uh, intervention, it's because you're good at having two conversations at one time. My inside conversation was, no way in the world was the chicken cold. I'd like to take you outside and smash you with the chicken bones. Okay, my outside conversation was, oh my heavens, we're not supposed to serve cold chicken. I don't know how that happened. I'm so sorry. Let me take that from you right now. And then you start realizing from a marketing standpoint, you've now left the area of handling her situation. You're really now on stage talking to the room, right? Because I'm insisting on taking that plate away. Oh, no, 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 no. If you didn't like your chicken, I'm taking it off the table right now. Oh, no, no, no. I ate most of it anyway. No, I'm fine. Oh, no, I insist. Oh, no. I okay, I insist. So I'm taking the chicken 
into the kitchen. I will throw it away and I will beat the chef. How's that? Will you be happy with that? I'm going to return with a complimentary chocolate dessert with some warm coffee. So her and her friends are nibbling. And I said, I just don't want you to leave with, you know, a cold taste in your mouth. So very, very sorry that happened. Shouldn't have happened. I, of course, took it off the ticket. Oh, you didn't need to do that. That's probably what she was looking for anyway. Of course I did. You know, no one's going to be paying for something that we did wrong. Of course, please enjoy your dessert. Please come back and see us. Now we wait a couple of minutes. Whoa, they're talking kibitzing, hopefully the dining room is seen. Wow, did you see what he did? I mean, hell, it looked like she ate the whole thing. Took it off the table, took it off the ticket. Wow, okay, wow, how cool. Then you come back with a nice little envelope, making sure everyone sees us. Hey, by the way, before you leave, since obviously, you know, we, we missed your lunch experience today. When you come back, this is a gift certificate uh, for a complimentary entree on your next visit. Oh no, that's unnecessary. No, absolutely, that's just what we do here. We wanna hit target, we didn't hit target. So you come back and let's start fresh and next lunch is on us. Okay, so now hopefully the dining room sees, wow, these people really care. The chicken may not have even been cold. Off the ticket, free dessert, gift card to come back, wow. Okay, now why was that good marketing? Some of you have probably already added this up. Maybe you do it already on your own. So, you know, this was all for marketing. What I did right there was an ad. I did uh, a social media post. Of course, this was years ago before we had that. That's what I did. And look how reasonable that was. Now somebody leaves with an envelope with my logo on it, right? Inside, there's a gift card with my logo on it, sitting around advertising my restaurant. Okay, I probably saved her from jumping in the Suburban and quickly going to Facebook or Yelp and posting about cold chicken. I probably saved that experience from happening because she left knowing that I'm full, that warm chocolate tort was wonderful, uh, I've got a gift card to come back for free. Okay, so that's the immediate advantage to me. What's the secondary advantage? How many people go somewhere and actually eat for free by themselves? Okay, I can tell you from my years of experience, none. So she's probably gonna come back and maybe with the same friends, if not a couple of other friends. And so just so that when the check comes, it can almost be like, oh, <laughs> do you have one of these? Oh, you guys have to pay for lunch. I have free lunch. I feel good, I'm important, I'm valuable, I've bonded with the restaurant, and I get something for free. Okay, so now, why was this great marketing? Let's add all of that up, okay? She ordered something for like 12 or $13. If we are running an accurate 33% food cost, so what did I do? I, I probably threw four something away by taking it off the ticket. Okay, I probably threw another couple of dollars off the way because I brought a $6 dessert, which probably cost me two to three to make. Okay, so, so far I'm in this for what, about $9. Okay, now let's say she comes back. This time, because it's free, she probably orders something more expensive. So um, maybe there's a higher cost in what she took, so another five, nine, $10. Okay, so in other words, this whole thing may have cost me $29 by the time I'm done or no, not that's too much, but 20, if we add that up, nine and nine and a couple. Okay, so, so 20, $22 for the whole experience. However, when she came back, she brought a couple of people with them. What they ordered probably covered that. If not, is that too much for marketing? Let's say that happened to you once or twice a month. Hopefully it doesn't, but let's say it does. Let's say it happened once a week. So that meant $80, somewhere between 80 and $100 you did by guest service, as marketing. What else could you have done that month in your market with $100 to build a good image, save customers, get two or three ladies to come back? I, I don't know of much. I, I, think, I think church bulletin ads cost that or even more now. And hardly anybody reads those. So for that money, not only did you save an instance, you created a second one that was positive, probably saved a negative Yelp, and all of that cost gets coded to marketing. There are some other interesting things that I've seen people do, marketing their menu, which really, really helps with the people coming back from COVID and coming into the dining room maybe for the first or second time. Maybe some of you are struggling with speed of service, um, staff's trying to get used to things, we're overwhelmed, we're understaffed. So how do we turn that into a marketing scenario? Well, I've seen some people dedicate a certain amount of food product. We're going to ring it up. We're gonna code it to marketing, okay? And it's either gonna be small little portions of things that we're going to give. As soon as they sit down, sorry that you had to wait so long. We're not using our total dining room. We're still a little understaffed. Welcome back, great to see you. 
Um, and I appreciate your patience. By giving them a small little portion, a little taster of something that is one of our specialties. Now we're gonna add all that up. And what we might be giving away is four servings or something, because we're doing it in really small, just little tastes, little lanyaps, little thank yous. So we do ring those up, but we code that to um, marketing, promotion. So if we did say four servings, and let's say it was an expensive serving of something that was on your menu for $20, so that means we ring up the 80, we code it to marketing, but what it really cost us was about a third of that. That's tremendous marketing. You might want to try it as, a, as an end of the meal experience. Again, sorry that you guys had to wait so long to come back. I hate that damn COVID, but I loved seeing you. Sorry that it took a little longer. You know, you know that we normally are operating on all cylinders, but tonight we aren't because, you know, we're still getting our act together. We're still short staffed. You know, I noticed you guys are in a bit of a hurry. No one ordered dessert. So before you leave here, just take a little taste of our lemon ice cake because I know you love it. Oh, that's so nice. You didn't need to do that. It's just a little taste. They're going to share it. And you probably cut only five or six pieces to pass out to the whole dining room. But these are little things that right now go a long ways to keep people leaving with a smile and coming back soon. So the community marketing, getting back to that, is a way of being able to keep our brand top of mind awareness with people in the community. Doing it in a manner where we're involved in what's important to the community. Maybe it's a woman's shelter, maybe it is a blood drive, maybe it's not, maybe it's a food pantry that needs help and we wanna adopt them this year. This is also a very organized way for your brand to be associated with what you and your other owners or your key staff have decided together is a good important mission for you. Um, is it something that has to do with cleaning the environment? Is that something to do with safety? Is it something that is a group you decided you'd like to see better in our city having to do with children, education? You know, like I said, you're not going to do it all, but you pick one, your brand gets associated with that one, and the costs that are involved all go to marketing because you're marketing your brand. Does that make sense? Okay, I know we talked about social media, but digital marketing has skyrocketed, so it's worth touching again. Please, <coughs> Make note of the fact that you can do some really cool active videos that can be done in-house with the technology that you have. Um, your staff and iPhones can do some really good interactive uh, playing out uh, why people need to come, what our Thursday special looks like, why this is good. So excited that our new chocolate mocha blah, blah, blah cake is back. Come see us. And these things work. You, it's a YouTube. You add it to your website. Um, you take that same item for your Instagram photos. And you're engaging your staff. They're part of your brand building. And they have fun at it. And trust me, they're probably better with the video and all the handheld technology than you are. So it's, it's a win-win all the way around. Making sure that that your website gets done, real, real important. So what's the one last thing that maybe we left out? One other item post COVID, very important and a great branding opportunity. That's brand extension. How we take our restaurant brand now and extend it to meet other areas of the consumer buying habit. How does that work? Packaging our food. Um, there's been a great increase in grab and go, large portions, family packs of one of your specialties that you might sell on your site or private labeling of your items that they might now see in other places, markets, convenience stores. Um, you might want to brand things that are special to you that there's a market for. Grocery stores are looking for cool, local, uh, small brands that they can promote. Why? Because it works. Uh, that's why Kroger is doing what HEB's been doing for years. It works. What started as about this much space of shelves of really cool local things to promote is now three times as big. It works. So do you have a seasoning? Do you have a salad dressing? Do you have a dip? Does it work? Sometimes we think these things are out of reach. They're not really. And I'm going to give you two really good examples. Uh, one really increased through COVID. A small business development uh, client in the College Station area, uh, Melissa and her husband Ralph, have a kalachi concept called Kalachi Ralph. Look them up. Um, they're okay units. They were doing okay volumes, really. I mean, they get by. They make a great product. It's an old German family recipe sausage that he has. That's his point of difference. But other than that, it's pretty much kalachis, coffee, counters. You've seen them before. Every town has them. 
Um, what they did though, is they realized that we're getting good requests for selling them by the dozen, by the two dozen. They started talking about a couple of years ago about food brokers on, is there a need? How could we package this? And they did start testing it in grocery stores and the test was successful. So successful that one of their units needed to do nighttime production just to do that. So what happens? Along comes COVID, they're closing their dining rooms, they're doing more production. What used to be 40, 50 grocery stores is now 145 HEBs selling their um, kolaches. Kroger, not to be left out, uh, is doing uh, what they call, I think, more of an initial test, which is like 40 Texas locations. They're going crazy. Packaging, boxing, labeling, um, their, their ham and cheese, their egg roll kolache, their sausage kolache. I think they have, then they have a couple of the fruit kolache. So the idea of packaging, freezing, getting things labeled, nutrition analysis, those kinds of things that aren't part of our everyday lingo, we think might be too hard to do, very expensive, come to find out, it isn't that easy, but it isn't very difficult, and it isn't extremely expensive, and a lot of restaurants are doing it. So much so, this husband and wife team are currently building a new large 5,000 square foot facility just for production in Navasota. So they see their future as maybe just having their couple of kolache shops, but really having a big, booming wholesale. They're out there now thinking grocery stores might be the, just the start. Maybe we could sell to food brokers for uh, contracts, for convention centers, for assisted care facilities, healthcare, hospitals. What about school systems? So their entire shift has changed. I'm not saying that's going to happen to every independent restaurant. But what I'm saying is that there's more stories out there of success than you think. The salad bar, I got a chance to work with them. It's called Salada. You may have seen him. He's been expanding a tremendous amount of saladas throughout Texas. I think he has 70 some locations. But he started in the city of Houston at the Small Business Development Center with an idea, a plan in one unit. I was very fortunate to work with him then. And I'm even more fortunate now to enjoy his success because he doesn't just have the salad bars. He has the Salada branded chicken marinades. He has the Salada branded line of dressings. He has the Salada branded soups. They are needed to come out of his production facility for his restaurants, but now they're being picked up by retail. Just like you saw how Whataburger's ketchup and mustard got picked up a few years ago for retail. And some of the small guys aren't left out. I'm gonna go back now to the catfish parlor guys. Remember them with the schools, the two places, the all you can eat catfish? Okay, well, they had an interesting family recipe, not very hard to make. It was just a zipped up tartar sauce, but it really tasted good and it was quite popular. It's a jalapeno tartar sauce. So I noticed when I was working with them years ago, customers would request some when they leave. And so there they were ladling the tartar sauce and these little styrofoam to goes. Sure, here, take some, here, take some. So then it got to be a point where on the weekends, they'd have some pre-made at the hostess stand. They're selling them for a dollar here, two dollars here, large, small. And so then came the thought, could this possibly be jarred? Could it be bought? If, would people buy this? So there's uh, a tremendous amount of these kitchens throughout the state of Texas. The closest one to them was a place called Texa France. Texa France is in Georgetown. They did the testing, they did the jarring, the nutrition analysis. It's what they do, they're a commercial kitchen. So now they had a prettier display with a nice logo and a little story about the restaurant and that could be stacked up and sold in the lobby. So what do you think happens to them while they're selling it in the lobby? They come to find out that one of their more steady Friday night, all you can eat catfish lovers just happens to, be, to work with HEB and he's one of the product buyers. So, bingo, they do a little test. I don't know how many stores, 30, 40, 50. Now, of course, it's being brokered through some broker. I see him in Bucky's and in grocery stores. And this is just a two restaurant group with a small family recipe of tartar sauce. So, what's yours? What's your menu item that might work? Is it a dip? Is it a sauce? You know, is it a marinade? Is it a barbecue seasoning? Um, are there some things that maybe people have asked if they could buy to take? Sometimes people that make bread in restaurants sell their rolls by the dozen. They start getting requests for, I'm having a party. Can I, you know, come by and buy 60 or 70? Maybe that's turning into a product line. But it's hard to talk about marketing, you know, without ending with the fact that there could be some new areas, you know, and not all areas will work for you. We know local store marketing, we know use of media, and we know community involvement really work on everyone's annual marketing plan. But for some of you, packaging, 
wholesale, this retail packaging, whether it's done in the store or whether it's done through distributions, could also be part of your annual marketing plan. It might work. There is a food truck uh, lady that I know now who has an interesting product. She sells egg rolls, but there's nothing traditional about these egg rolls. They look like an egg roll, they're fried and crispy like an egg roll, but what's inside are different whacked out ingredients. She's got a Jamaican chicky jerked Caribbean seasoning egg roll that's delicious. She has a barbecue brisket mac and cheese egg roll that's delicious. She's in test kitchens right now. We're working on product portioning, nutritional analysis, we're working on labeling uh, and introductions to different food brokers. It might work for her. She might go from one food truck to a complete retail line of products. I don't know. It might not get picked up, but it might work. So, so those are some of the tidbits. Those are the things that I wanted to cover uh, on the topic of marketing today in the post-COVID market area for independently owned restaurants. Hopefully some light bulbs blinked. Hopefully some notes were taken. Maybe you'll get with your key staff and you'll decide to look back at what worked and how to maybe plan that in advance so it can do nothing but work better. Uh, maybe we can take a look at what items cost so that we can look back at these items and see where did we get our best bang for the buck. And if nothing else, maybe we can remember that the way we operate isn't just operating. It isn't just to get through the shift, clean up afterwards, and don't forget to deposit the money. It isn't working for the shift. It's marketing for the future because those people that have ordered online or were in the parking lot picking up or in your dining room or on your patio are giving you an opportunity not just for today's revenue, but for marketing mouthpieces of the future. Thanks very much for coming in. If I think we have a couple